Hi, this is Paula from CHE. Today we're doing a panel discussion on municipal affairs. We'll be talking with Inverness County CAO Keith McDonald, with District 1 Councilor Alfred Poirier for Shetty Campus and BN Mid Cove, and with District 2 Councilor Lori Cranton for Margaria and St. Joseph. We'll be speaking about the latest council meeting from July 9. Topics include a motion to allow voting online and by telephone in advance polls at the October municipal election, road repairs, a committee to tackle systemic racism, and more. Here's our conversation. I wanted to go over uh, what was talked about at the latest council meeting. And I wanted to start uh, with the, uh, the bylaw to authorize uh, voting by telephone and web for the coming election in October. Uh, so Keith, could you tell me more about that? Certainly. So the municipality has a returning officer for the upcoming municipal election. Uh, his name is Bernie Gillis. Uh, he's done a significant amount of research on how various municipalities are approaching the upcoming election in October. Um, certainly, there's been um, quite a discussion between the province and the municipality in terms of uh, the impact the pandemic uh, may have on that election. But right now, the province has uh, in indicated and has uh, requested and is made it known that the election will be proceeding. In order to do that um, and to run the meeting locally, uh, Derny wanted to try to take up an approach that allows for as many people to vote uh, as possible. And certainly in the pandemic situation, people may have great concern in going to a centralized location with numerous other people to vote. Uh, so, uh, approach uh, was brought to council to allow for uh, electronic and possibly telephone voting for this upcoming election. Um, Mr. Gillis will be doing providing some additional updates to council as he readies for the election in terms of polling the areas um, and other and when and how they will be doing uh, a potential electronic and phone system for voting. Uh, right now, he's leaning towards having that available for advanced polls only. Uh, so uh, that'll be for a duration of time and before the day of the election. And that uh, the day of the election, there still would be uh, uh, polling stations throughout the, the county. Uh, and that way, we can ensure that uh, people have uh, various ways to vote and still feel uh, safe. And as I understand, the public can uh, provide their opinion about this, right? In August? Yes, yeah, so there'll be a public hearing. People can, uh, it'll be an online hearing. People can register just by calling the municipality uh, and they'll be invited to uh, a meeting similar to this on Zoom. And then they can provide input on on the uh, bylaw uh, supported or if they have concerns. Is this something that you might see for coming elections as well, or it's only because of the pandemic? Well, currently it's just for this particular election due to the pandemic situation. Uh, I'm sure council and the returning officer will be monitoring uh, how the uh, how everything went. Uh, and it could be something that subsequent council could determine that the municipality will want to take an approach on on an ongoing basis by having uh, uh, electronic and or uh, phone voting for, for uh, residents. Uh, but right now it's just for this pandemic situation and the municipality did not have a bylaw that allowed for electronic or telephone voting. So that's why this has been moved forward. Is this something that the councillors uh, agree with? Let's start with Alfred. Uh, do you think this is a good idea? Well, uh, at first, when we, uh, you know, when we had a general discussion about this is that, uh, you know, we were not really sure, you know, how it would be going, etc. But, uh, and then we had uh, the municipalities under the Nova Scotia municipalities with Pam Mood, you know, a mayor of Yarmouth, you know, who 
with the support of uh, a lot of municipalities, you know, wanted first and foremost to postpone the election this fall and maybe move it at a later point. But uh, after talking with the minister, uh, I, we can see that it was a no-go and uh, that uh, it will it will be an election as per uh, you know these conditions and another thing that we have to keep bear in mind is that uh, we all know what is happening right now and it sure looks like it you know that it's that's the way it's going to be you know if uh, for example i was thinking if we do get the second wave and uh, if it is in September, well, chances are that uh, we might have to uh, change ways of doing, you know, uh, this election again. So, but in general, you know, uh, you know, at first we most council, uh, most councillor, I think, I would say myself included, would have liked to postpone it. But uh, at this point in time, it's it's a it's a go, and we're I'm ready to go. Glory? Certainly. I support this, this uh, opportunity to have the uh, voting done online. It, uh, it adds another dimension to how people can get to the polls. And in the COVID situation, uh, it's a safe way to do it. Not everybody is computer literate enough to maybe be able to do this, but they may have family or friends that can help them and they still cast their vote, but to help them set it up. And uh, as far as whether the election goes ahead or not, I know we had some discussion around that, but the, uh, uh, I think there was concerns among council about how they would do the door-to-door -door canvassing and that type of thing. Um, myself using a wheelchair, I wasn't able to do that anyway, so it didn't bother me much. And I said, it put me in a more level playing field with everybody else. So, uh, but I think we're ready to go. And I think this, this dimension of voting online will, will give everybody, so you can vote online, you can vote in the advance poll, I believe, and you can vote the day of the election as you normally would. So it's just another opportunity to cast your vote and, and, as you have the right to do. Do you have any idea at the moment on how, they, how this would look like? Um, is there a link that people should access? Uh, how will it work, Keith? Currently, the municipality has put up a uh, a web page on our website that's dedicated for the uh, election information. So currently, it's containing information for those who uh, are seeking to uh, run and all the details around that. Um, and as uh, the election become closer to the election date, more and more information on polling stations and and uh, the process to uh, to be able to uh, vote online and and possibly via phone will be all uh, put on that site. Uh, and on top of that, we'll certainly be putting out uh, advertising uh, to make people aware of how they can vote. Okay. Um, I wanted to move on to uh, J Class Roads. Uh, I saw on the minutes description of the meeting. Uh, that you, the council was going to get in contact with the province uh, to see if some of the roads could be repaired. Um, so uh, could you tell me more about that? Certainly. So uh, the municipality, uh, we, we do not have, uh, um, we're, we're not responsible for the roads in Inverness County, except for uh, just three particular roads. Um, so the province has the authority around a great majority of the roadways in and around the county. Uh, so they have various classifications for roads and there's one classification uh, that's called J-class roads, uh, where the province of Nova Scotia has had a, over the last number of years, a, a J-class road funding program. Uh, the, uh, the only one that the municipality has the ability to uh, contribute towards road um, asphalting and uh, upgrading to asphalt from uh, uh, gravel type roads. So uh, every year, over the last number of years, the province uh, asks municipalities throughout Nova Scotia that have these type of designated roads 
uh, to uh, submit a list for consideration uh, and the province of just reviews that list and then they allocate uh, potentially, not always, uh, a number of roads for uh, uh, upgrading or uh, asphalting. Uh, so this year that program was released. Um, a list was submitted from each of the districts listing some roads, except uh, for Lori Cranton's District 2, there are no roads classified in his district as J-Class, uh, so no roads are submitted for that uh, district. Uh, and again, the province reviews those. They make some decisions, they make some estimates, they bring that back to the council to determine uh, if they want to provide the fee to see split on the, on the uh, cost of that road work. On top of that, this year the province has added a. Uh, uh, hasn't happened, and some I can't say if it's maybe never happened, but certainly it's the first time uh, in quite some time that the province has added what they call the second phase. So in, uh, they released this year uh, a lot more funds for second phase for J class roads, and municipalities again across the province were asked met some other roads for consideration. So uh, the council put the board put together a list and again they went through that and uh, and selected some other roads for repaving. So the council had to consider if they were going to contribute uh, the 50 percent for each road. So in terms of this session um, for district one I'm fairly certain there was four roads uh, that were approved for the J class road program. I don't have the list in front of me. Uh, Councillor uh, or sorry, Deputy uh, Warden Poirier may, may know those right off the top of his head, but there'll be four J-class roads in the Shetty Camp area that will be uh, uh, resurfaced with asphalt. Which are the four roads here in District 1? Yeah, well, uh, for sure. Uh, and first and foremost, uh, I want to be clear that I, you know, I put all the names basically of all the JROs that we had, and uh, you know, the province, you know, came up with uh, those word, roads. Uh, first of all, is the O'Coins Road or uh, Père Fizette uh, Girouard Road Avenue, and that's where the dollar store is at, you know, the senior apartments that there's, uh, you know, that one. Marto Road around across the Arbor Restaurant, uh, Laurie's. Uh, Road uh, on this side, south side of Flores Motel, and Robbins Road, which is across from uh, the uh, Poirier's Fish Haven, you know, like in, and those are the four fork roads that were accepted by the province and overall with the other roads approved by the municipality. Okay, so they've been approved by the municipality, so they're going to be repaired and covered by both. That's yeah. right. It's a 50-50 cost share program. And again, it's just for this particular classification of road. I know a lot of residents get frustrated because they may have a road right next, right beside this one that looks very similar in makeup and a number of residents. Um, but the province classifies it under another uh, class. That could be I or G or whatever it may be. Um, so I know that that raised a lot of questions in some communities. Why does this road get paved and, and so on and so forth. But this is the only program that the municipality has available to it uh, to, to, uh, to work with the province to do some uh, additional repaving. If I, if I could just add to that as well, yeah. um, uh, our uh, CAO, uh, Keith McDonald just mentioned that District 2, which is my district, has no uh, uh, roads classed uh, for this, this uh, infrastructure investment. However, we do have a lot of roads that need um, significant upgrading in terms of asphalt and ditching and paving. And um, they, they have made some, some good plans for that. And then transportation has changed their mind. And, and decided to do a lesser amount. Right now, we have a real push on in the uh, East Marguerite, uh, Arsenault Hill area 
to, uh, and we're pushing the provincial government to take a look at that, to put some investment in the up in those uh, roads on the opposite side of the highway from the Cabot Trail side. Um, it would be all that from Doyle's Bridge to Bellcote and uh, in our Snow Hill and probably not going to all happen this year, but there's some stuff that has to happen because there's some dangerous situations along that road. So as a counselor, I'm working right now with a group of community minded people there that are very interested in seeing something done with the roads. And I support them a hundred percent on that. If I might add also is that, uh, you know, like uh, I, you know, said on the radio station, the local French radio station, is that, uh, you know, Sometimes people are saying, you know, and I know they will be saying once they see the, the pavement coming in and the asphalt. And, uh, but the point is, is that uh, we, like uh, Councillor Cranton said, we're working hard on the uh, province road that uh, the province are neglecting. I just got another calls and uh, you know, and I, I'm getting all the calls and everything, but at the same time, I like to take my responsibility where it is. But uh, this, uh, the roads like the Shadikam Island, the Red Man Road, all these roads, Shamar Sheikh, you know, it's all Alan McMaster and the province of Nova Scotia, the Liberal Party that are supposed to be looking after that, you know, and uh, I get an awful lot of calls and, you know, putting the blame, not the blame on me, but in other words, what can you do? But the point is that as counselors, we can only control what we do have by the municipality. So if I may ask, there's four roads in District 1 that are, uh, that kind of, they would be covered by both 50% the province, 50% the municipality. And the rest of them, you say, they all belong to the province? Well, for the most part, um, we'll be posting the J-Class road list that we're provided by the province on our website, so people can have a better understanding. Uh, there are some additional J-Class roads in, in the Shady Camp area, um, but there's not a great amount of them compared to, let's say, uh, Inverness. Uh, the community of Inverness has the, the greatest bulk of, of the roads because it used to be a former town. Um, so, uh, but then the province looks at, at the, the uh, condition of each one of those when they're submitted and, and the councillors uh, every year, they put in their list of, of roads that they feel through communication <coughs> with the residents that are in the most disrepair. Uh, but we don't have any input as a municipality on that decision. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's an internal decision with transportation and infrastructure renewal. And then when we get the list back, it's uh, usually pared down um, significantly. And, uh, and then council has to decide if they were are willing to uh, match what the province uh, will put in for those uh, uh, road upgrades. And do you usually get repairs every year? No, there's been some years where no roads have been funded through the program for the municipality. Okay. I, it's just, I, I'm fairly certain last year uh, there was no J-class road uh, work done in the, in the municipality. Right. But I mean the rest of the roads. Oh, the rest, there would have been, the municipality wouldn't have contributed to it and it would be under the provincial annual Paving program. So last year, I do not believe that any there was any day class road work done performed within Inverness County. I'm, sure, I'm certain there was throughout the province, but uh, we wouldn't have, we didn't have any roads last year. I think we were I I wanted to move on to uh, the town of Mulgrave. That there's been a, a letter of support written by the municipality. Um, could you tell me more about that? It was seconded by, uh, by Alfred, right? At Council of Parway? Yeah, it was, based, it was supported unanimously by the council to write a letter of support for Town of Mulgrave. Town of Mulgrave has uh, brought to uh, the municipality's attention and, and they've been uh, talking about this broadly as, 
at the CBRM, Cape Breton Regional Municipality, uh, received a uh, uh, their portion of the CBRM's portion of infrastructure funds uh, has been covered by the province in some of their uh, uh, upcoming uh, infrastructure projects through the latest federal provincial infrastructure program. And the town of Mulgrave has, uh, has dealt find that that's unfair to other municipalities that the province uh, helps support the CBRM and uh, towns such as Mulgrave and other municipal units not see, receive the same amount of same support from the province. Uh, so they're asking questions of why that, that transpired. And so council uh, had a presentation from the CAO of the town of Mulgrave and, and heard about, uh, and she provided great detail around this. Uh, so council um, uh, has put together a letter to uh, request the province for more explanation uh, around uh, why the CBRM has been able to uh, have the uh, province cover up their contribution to this uh, some significant infrastructure work that's ongoing there. Meanwhile, the town of Mulgrave is struggling and, and the cost of their project is, is significant in term, and particularly in terms of their annual budget. So, um, yeah, that's letters um, being forwarded to the province. Okay. Anything uh, any of the councillors would like to add? No, I would say, you know, it's about fairness and uh, that's why we all agreed, I would say, in, in general because, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're all struggling and uh, everybody should be treated equally. And I would echo what Count Deputy Warden Poirier just, uh, just said as well. I wanted to move on to uh, the committee on on systemic racism. Well, uh, you know, my motion is, uh, you know, was, and uh, it, I think it's to get a better understanding of all the people that we, that uh, are included in our, in our county, in Inverness County in general, but also all across Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, Canada, and everywhere, you know, it's the same as uh, we talked about the guys rule. It's about fairness, it's about equalization, it's about, uh, you know, respect, it's about, uh, you know, be a, being able to uh, uh, associate and be friends with all over, whatever your nationality, and, uh, because uh, it is, a, it's a big problem that is eating our our streets, our communities, and the world in general. So it is a committee that I, I, you know, feel that I would like to be on and to work and uh, because of the, you know, the, the diversity that we do have. And who would be members of this committee? Well, that hasn't been determined yet. The uh, council is, uh, has <coughs> proved that a, a committee be formulated so we'll have to come up with a plan of uh, what the membership may look like or if it's uh, a, a probably have to do some consultation around that and then uh, we'll bring some recommendations to back to council for terms of reference and then uh, we'll go from there. And would you have an idea in what areas would the committee look at? In terms of Geographical areas or just particular areas of, of races? Would it go into, would they look at the budget? Would they look at, um, you know, hospitals? How that, how would that work? Well, I, I, I don't want to speak for council, but from the conversation, I think they just wanted to leave it open. Uh, they're not other set of the overall theme. Uh, they haven't dedicated what the committee should be uh, looking at closely. Uh, I think the next step is to try to engage people around what what the priorities of the committee will, will be and what they want to look at for second and third. And then uh, council will hear recommendations from that committee that they can make some decisions on uh, going forward. So 
the co-counselors can add uh, add on to this, but my sense is council just wants to leave it open for now and and hear back from as many people as possible. Yeah, I understand exactly. You know what the CAO uh, uh, Keith say in McDonald is it, it it is you know we're at the beginning of it. You know we see the problem we see, and uh, as we get organized, you know we will. Of course, there's no way that we can really start before we start meeting, have different groups and different, uh, you know, people, and then we'll see how we can improve uh, the relationship, you know, among uh, ourselves. If I could just, if I could just add to that, uh, I agree with what both my colleagues are saying. However, and and, and giving that, you know. I think we, we as counselors all recognize that there is racism to, within the municipality, but we haven't got a full handle on, I don't think, to what extent yet, um, or what, you know, or where there may be more issues in one community than another. I think we have to study all that and make sure we're putting our strengths behind where the, the issues exist and come back to council with <laughs> Some ideas of how we can improve things for all people within the within the county and maybe beyond, and uh, also pass our our uh, our thoughts and and uh, plans up the line as well. Where and we may learn from other communities as well up the line as to how how they're dealing with this. So I think it's wide open at this point to look at it, develop a term of reference develop uh, a potential membership to the committee so that we have the right people around there to put us in the right direction. And then we see where all that comes out in the wash. Like we will need to, uh, we'll need to look at uh, what the results of that are and then uh, make our, uh, you know, our, uh, our, our work move in the appropriate direction and, Hopefully it'll bring some well thought out ideas and and move us to a better better communities within the municipality. What are the next steps from now on? When is this committee going to be formed? Well, um, we'll be looking at uh, having that discussion uh, at an upcoming meeting of council. Uh, certainly, our first step we're just we're going to take a look at. Uh, some of the other uh, similar type of committees and their work uh, that are attached to municipalities in Canada, just to give a bit of a framework for council. Um, and then they'll give us staff some direction on on uh, the next steps after that, which um, I, I, I think will be a bit of engagement uh, to the community and on uh, what, what the, the approach or the focus of the committee should be. So. Uh, yeah, we have a bit more to discuss with the council around that, but we'll be working out on that over the next few, uh, few council meetings. Okay, I wanted to move on to the pride flag, right, at the municipality. It's going to be raised every June? Yes, I guess, you know, we, uh, as far as I know, I think we, you know, when pride month, you know, the month of June, and uh, we all agreed, and uh, I think it's only appropriate, you know, like I said, it's all about fairness and, uh, you know, treat everybody equally. And I, uh, I supported that 100%. And so th did the other councillors. And uh, I would say that, uh, you know, we're, we're very happy and proud of it. I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy and proud of it anyway. So we're going to wait until next June, right? Next year to see it? It was up this year. It was we. It just came down recently, so uh, we did display it this year. And you know, it can be done each year if council agrees. I believe with an election coming up, we could have different members on council. But um, I wanted to ask about about the St. Rose Community Dividend Fund. Um, as I understand, does this have to do with green energy? It does. If I, I'll go on that one. It's in my district. Um, 
it has to do with the windmill and what we call St. Rose, which is along the shore road there. And Scotia, I believe it's Scotia Wind Energy is the name of the company. They um, provide 1% of the revenue for, from that windmill goes back to the community, which is, is very nice. And it works out to a few thousand dollars every year. And we are we we designed a catchment area where that money needs to be spent. Which um, and we just had the, the the company approve the money coming directly to council and trust, so that we can spend it in that catchment area for projects that are of a benefit to the community. And it's pretty pretty broad in terms of what we can spend it on. So far, we have helped upgrade the. Uh, the paved road down to the wharf in uh, in Bell Coat that was recently done. Um, we've done some bursaries at the, the school, and we've also accrued this, some money in that fund that we can use. We have a little extra right now that we can use for some projects. Um, and uh, if if someone has an interest in something in the the area there, they could certainly contact the municipality. Um, and that may be one of the sources of funding. There's a number of uh, various sources of funding we can work with in the community, but and they're all limited, but uh, this adds to that community uh, another source of funding that can be used for you know vital projects to the community. Could this be a program uh, that could be extended beyond uh, District 2? If there, I would think if that same company had windmill that has that program had windmills in other jurisdictions, and I think like there's one in Bedeck that does that would be in another county, but I know I'm pretty sure there's funds made available for that one in the same way to the community there. Um, so, um, but it's a particular company that offers this in support of the people that you know have those, uh windmills in their in their communities and it's a way of giving back but uh, it's only the one company that i know of that does that that doesn't mean another company couldn't be encouraged to do it if they were existing in a company in a community so i i think it's an excellent program and it's an excellent way for them to help benefit the community but it would be up to that company and it would be up to where they've established their windmills probably Okay, so uh, finally, I, I wanted to go into the Sheikh and Salmon Association. Um, could you tell me more about what's been decided? Well, it's an exciting project. I'll let both the councillors talk about it a little bit. Uh, they they both cooperated on this initiative. Okay, the, the project I think you're referring to may be the development of a uh, fishing wharf that is accessible to uh, various individuals with disabilities so they can get out on the water to an extent and fish and fish from from this uh, this dock sort of where you could it would be totally accessible and built for that purpose there is a similar one built in Marguerite by the salmon association last year which is in Lake Law. if you go into the park in Lake Law, you can see one there and they're looking in the Granitang area, I believe, Granitang Lemoyne area somewhere, I'm not sure where, of developing a, uh, a fishing uh, platform like this. And so what we've done is we have some community development among money within each district and council, uh, Deputy Warden Poirier and myself have cost-shared uh, an investment into the fund, into uh, that project to help them proceed and help them fund the cost of developing it. And certainly with someone with a disability like I do, and I really got into fishing this year myself, I've used the one in Lake Law and I look forward to using that one. And I've used some nuts have developed as well. And uh, I like the back 40 and the backwoods. So, uh, but it, it gives, it'll give, there's a lot of people I'm sure that enjoy fishing in, in that area that can't get out the way they might once did and uh, hopefully they'll be able to catch some, some some fish there so Alfred I don't know if you want to add anything to that or 
No, that's, uh, you know, I mean, that's, uh, like I said, you know, we were all for it. And I mean, the better uh, facility that we do have, and uh, I think it's great to have a combination of both District 1 and 2 to get together on this project. And uh, it's, uh, it's all good. Any idea on when it's going to be ready? No, oh, I'm not sure. Uh, sorry, Councillor. You can go ahead. You may have more details. Yeah, well, I get the same answer. I'm not sure yet. We were just asked to help fund it. It's probably in the paperwork somewhere that they have a start and end date. But uh, I would imagine they'll be working at it throughout the, the summer months, however long it'll take. Depends on the design they, they pick and, uh, and what it'll take to to do that i know the one up in marigree is is baked, baked built out of aluminum so it's it's a uh took some time with welding and fabrication i'm not sure if they plan wood or aluminum there's a number of ways you can construct that so it'll depend on what they have in their plans and i'm sure uh deputy warden Pori and myself will be chatting with them in the near future to see where they are and uh Usually these projects don't get funded until they are, they are complete or well underway. You can send us your questions at chne.television at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.